Can these uh, fitness landscapes be measured? Is there, is there a way to measure these heights and, uh, and so on? And perhaps a follow-up question. You, you have shown these landscapes having two minima, two maxima, I guess, right? Is it possible at all that these are actually flat, plateau-like surfaces and these, there's no real advantage in having, uh, having, having a location at one, one particular point, but all these hybrids mm -hmm. are possible and they, by accident, diverge and they, and they converge again? Right. How does one rule out, rule out that possibility? Okay, those are good questions. So the first is, um, can we quantify the fitness landscapes? It's actually incredibly difficult. Okay, so in theory, yes. The problem is measuring fitness in a natural population. And we are doing that. We're trying to do that by... Monitor That's actually why we're recording the positions of all these plants. So we can see what progeny they produce uh, in the next generation, what each genotype, what you need to know is what each genetic combination generate contributes to the next generation so it's it's difficult to do but now with dna sequencing technologies you have the potential for doing precisely that comparing the individuals of the next generation to the parents and seeing who produced the most offspring so that allows us to quantify these landscapes but it's still really early days okay you won't find people that will have done this intensively because it's still a big problem because you have to record every plant and all the progeny as well so that's doable. Is it possible that things are flat in terms of their landscapes? And um, if they're very flat, then you, the, there's no evolutionary bound, no problem evolutionarily in terms of moving from one position to another. So when you look at uh, different species or within a species, you find, may find certain polymorphisms, like, for example, eye color, okay, which may not be either advantageous or disadvantageous, and so you end up with variation. But when you look at comparing different populations, quite often you'll find barriers between them. Okay? For example, reproductive barriers. I talked about a very minor barrier just to do with flower colour. But you can also have a well-known one is a horse and a donkey. You hybridise them, you generate a mule. All right? So you end up with these genetic incompatibilities. Most species cannot be crossed with each other. All right, that's telling you that there's some problem there. And that's why you have these notions that actually you need these dips. There are these dips. These are the problems that Darwin was around. How do you create these dips, these incompatibilities? So in that sense, when you're comparing species, there are these dips and everything isn't flat. Otherwise, everything would cross with everything else. And we would all just be one big happy family, as it were, <laughs> which, which we're not. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. yeah, my name's Bruce Mackay. My question is, you notice this difference, but you can see it. You're driving down the road. But there could have been other differences. I mean, they could have all been the same colour. And you say, oh, look at the lovely snapdragons. Mm -hmm. But there could have been difference, different differences, couldn't there? I mean, differences of shape or things. So were you surprised when you found the... I mean, the di I think you called it relative divergence mm -hmm. on the, the chart, relative divergence. It was the genes for colour that spiked up. I mean, there could have been an unexpected difference, which, am I right? That you no, you're, that what you're saying is absolutely right. We were stunned when we saw how few difference, how few islands there were. And um, we were expecting many more. And the conclusion we came to was the one, the story that I've told you, but it wasn't what we expected. We'd expect, it t what it tells you is that maybe there aren't that many genes that have, if you, over a short evolutionary time scale, most genes will be Starbucks genes. And there'll be a few that will have this property, but not that many. If you left a system run for longer, you'd accumulate more and more examples like that. And that's maybe what happens when species really can't even cross hybridize because you've then got a whole bunch of genes. So we kind of caught it at a sweet spot where we just found sufficiently small differences <laughs> that we could do the genetics and the analysis. And you're right, it was cause, partly because it, it was a visual phenotype. And there are hybrids. You might, you might wonder whether there are other traits that are carving up populations that we don't see because they're not showing some obvious phenotype. There is, though, something rather curious about colour, which is that it may be uh, maybe these first things that these incompatibilities are often related to sexual reproduction. So sex or colour is very much to do with signalling, all right? Signalling, in this case, from the flower to the bee. It's very important the bee attracts 
uh, sorry, a flower attracts bees, okay? Not only because it's got a set seed, but because of its male fitness. In other words, if a bee visits a flower, then it will go and spread its pollen on other flowers. All right, so it's very important. It's a part of its sexual sort of interaction. And so these sexual traits may be particularly prone to these evolutionary um, scenarios where you discover new strategies for attracting pollinators or sexual interaction. So it may be that it's not purely chance that it was color, but actually it also is, is a feature that lent that's related particularly to sexual selection. Hello, my name is Frank Heiler. Um, I had a question about um, the, the fact that you've got historical data from these populations. Are we trying to elucidate, elucidate the function of those different color morphs? Um, is, is, it, is, is it true then that they seem to be reasonably stable in space? And do you think that tells you something about potential function? I suppose what I'm trying to say is why wouldn't, have, why wouldn't you see one color morph invading the range of another more extensively than appears to be the case? Right. Now, that's another good question. Um, why is it kept so sharp? All right? And you can quantify, theoretically, how sharp a boundary should be by both the selection against hybrids all right, and the dispersal rate of the, of the plant. So actually, you only need a few percent drop in fitness to create quite a sharp boundary. All right? If you just do the math, so it's like, how much will these things mix? It's often quite counterintuitive. You won't get much mixing, basically because genes find it very hard to invade the other population because they're going to be, because they're always going to be generating bad combinations whenever an allele tries to invade. So that's what keeps it sharp. You could expect that the boundary would shift with time. All right, that over time it might move drift from from one geographic position to another. But again, that's going to be quite slow because that's going to depend on the dispersal rate and also the population size. So these are kind of numerical issues as to how fast this boundary is going to move. We've actually monitored it now for something like 17 years, and we haven't seen it appreciably move, you know, more than maybe a few metres at most. So it's a statistical distribution. Right? It's not an absolute... You saw, in fact, you saw little spots of colour not showing sort of like bits of non-yellow and the yellow and so forth. So it's a statistical distribution, but even so, it seems to keep that boundary quite sharp because it's basically a numbers game. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to ask about, so the graph that you had with the white and the orange uh, flowers. So the orange flowers were where you've got a high expression of, I guess it's, is it like homozygote dominant mm -hmm. uh, rosea and, and the same for the Flavia? So I understand that the stencils are in the white, you, you have high stencil and low pigment. Mm -hmm. But with the orange one, you've got low, no stencil and high pigment. So, but in the flowers, they still looked like there was some sort of arrangement and some sort of physical patterning. Mm. So do we know what, if it's just disorganized in terms of pigment and there's no stents or do we have a do you know of the genes that might govern mm -hmm. the areas where those pigments are so yeah another excellent question the so yeah i presented a somewhat simplified picture okay. um I, I specifically talked about the four genes involved in in the variation between the two species, but there are other genes as well involved in color, and they may also be modifying the thing, so you don't end up with a completely uniform. So you, you're right, you saw that in fact that the, that the orange isn't completely uniform, even in that case. And so there are other genes in the background that may be also influencing exactly where these pigments are made or not on their distributions. And it's actually quite a difficult problem to figure out exactly how you localize these pigments. Because I said to you there was a stencil. What I didn't say to you is, well, what controls the stencil? Okay, you could say, why is the stencil gene only where it is? So there's a whole set of questions about how you regulate these, these stencils and these sprays through these negative and positive interactions. So you don't end up... So the, so the ground state in this case, where you overexpress everything, is not as simple as uniformity because you've still got other genes. I mean, there's about... It's probably of the order of... Um, 15 genes involved in the pigments and then there's the regulators so there's a whole bunch of genes so I'm just focusing on the ones that are varying between the two forms that I told you about 
Um, thank you very much. A very clear explanation. Where, 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 where are you? Sorry. Oh, there you are. <laughs> very okay. clear explanation. Thank you. I'd have certainly sooner met you at the party than the other person you were talking about. <laughs> I can tell you that. Well, that's, that's made my day. <laughs> this is a complete flyer, but in human evolution recently, things have constantly started to change, obviously with Homo forensis, the stuff in Georgia, um, the Denisovans, etc., etc. Um, are there any <clears throat> um, observations or comments from your study of evolution that might help in any way to inform a <clears throat> more, you know, a, a developing theoretical conception of now being so, a whole more number of species to, to come and how that would work out, or any observations on human, humans at all in, in terms of their differences? Yeah, in terms of, um, so what's the, what are the implications for this in terms of human variation? Is that what you're asking? Um, I think it depends on different time scales. For example, if you think about the origin of humans, um, Homo sapiens, in fact, one of the main things was, as in, the, in this oversimplistic form, was coming from the trees and going onto, onto land, all right? So leaving the forests and becoming bipedal and sort of um, hunting for, for meat and a different way of life. That's thought to be one of the key components of human evolutionary story. So that's rather like a genetic pioneer in the sense that I've been talking about. So that is exploring new environments. So human evolution is also full of this issue of, of how humans have explored different environments. There's also been issues of hybridization in human, like the Neanderthals and um, Homo sapiens. Humans are rather unusual in, in that they... Um, Let's see. See, a snapdragon never really tries to kill another snapdragon. <laughs> um, humans don't seem to quite have realised that that isn't maybe the best, nicest thing to do. So, um, so, yeah, there are those issues as well when you think about the Neanderthals um, uh, and, uh, and Homo sapiens and um, the evolution of history involved there. And then, of course, there's the current, the ver the current variation in populations which all the same techniques that I've been talking about are being applied to variation in human populations, trying to understand the selective coefficients operating in human populations on different um, alleles, different variants, trying to measure things like fitness uh, so that we can predict and explain why there are all these different variations in, in the human population, which are a vast number, and trying to understand the forces that dictate the frequencies of these different variations. Humans used to be um, the genetic poor cousins of, of genetics. So in the sense that you couldn't do controlled crosses with humans. Okay? So humans were always thought of as a rather inferior laboratory organism. Okay? <laughs> because you didn't have this control. And so much of genetics wasn't worked out with humans. Okay? Much, much of genetics was worked out by studying other organisms. Snapdragons was great, had its heyday in about 1910. For about two years, two or three years, it was the best understood genetic organism. And then there were fruit flies, and there was E. coli, and there were mice, and there were nematodes. There's a whole bunch of organisms that have been studied to understand the principles of genetics. However, with the advent of genomics, that's changed things dramatically. Because now, all of a sudden, you can access information about human genomes in a way that, um, with a coverage, that actually dwarfs every other species. Because we're now sequencing humans at the rate of, you know, at a very high rate. Moreover, we have very strong phenotypic or information about the uh, phenotypes, the, the appearance or the, the traits of humans, all right, because of all the medical records. So actually, humans now have turned into be, being a very powerful system for understanding, forgetting the fact that we're interested in humans. If you're just interested in genes and how genes operate and behave in populations, actually humans have become uh, a, a really strong area of research. Um, earlier on, you, oh, you mentioned variegated DNA, where it like moved from one right. position to another. Um, how does this work and what, what's the point of it? <laughs> Good question. Um, so I showed you variegated flowers, right? And uh, these flowers actually carry a piece of DNA inserted in a gene needed for pigment production. And every so often, this gene, this piece of DNA, moves out of the, of the flower, of the, of the cell, 
uh, of, of the DNA and restores the activity of the gene. So you end up with a patch of cells which have the restored gene. Okay, that's, that's what you're seeing with those flowers. The question is, why does this exist? And there's a whole bunch of theories about where these moving pieces of DNA come from. One idea is that actually they're like, kind of like viruses, that they're just things that propagate in the genome, all right, that off their own sort of steam, and the genome is just like carries all these parasites, all right, these genetic parasites that jump around. And if you want to spread as a parasite, jumping around from one position to another is a good way, is a good strategy for spreading. So that's one view. Another possibility is that actually it's a very powerful way of creating new genetic variation and that maybe evolution has exploited that as well. So there's a whole bunch of theories as to why these elements are there. But they're there for sure, and they're there in your genome as well. Your genome contains a large number of these repeated sequences that can move around from one position to another. Okay, so if there are no further questions, it would be um, appropriate, I think, to give Rico another big round of applause and thank him very much. Thank you.